for the launch of our fall uh, season, which promises to be both substantive and quite exciting with a number of speakers from both the private and public sector and from the U.S. and abroad. So we have a very rich program and I hope that we'll see many of you at as many of those events as possible. And I want to thank all of you, all of our members and especially the 291 members of the Centennial Society who make this program possible. We have become the leading platform for nonpartisan discussions of economic, financial, social and political issues. And I want to thank all of you for making that possible. I am um, happy to welcome today students who are joining us from the Fordham Gabelli School of Business, and as well um, members of our Economic Club of New York Fellows, which is a select cohort of next generation thought leaders that are sponsored by members of the club. So I welcome you here today. And of course, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest this afternoon, Jay Clayton, who's the chairman of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, he was um, confirmed sworn in in May of 2017. Confirmed sworn in in May of 2017. His key areas of focus uh, at the commission uh, thus far have been uh, investor protection, transparency, and fairness, ensuring that uh, investors, both retail and larger investors uh, have uh, access to both private and public markets. He has um, focused very much on updating and enhancing regulation and oversight of markets, taking into account advances in technology, making our capital markets more accessible to businesses and investors, and ensuring that the United States remains the world's leader in terms of transparency, effective disclosure, and investor protection. Prior to joining the commission, uh, Jay has had an illustrious career as a lawyer, a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell, where he was a member of the firm's management committee and co-head of the firm's corporate practice. From 2009 to 2017, he was a lecturer in law and adjunct professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. A member of the New York and Washington, D.C. bars, Jay earned a B.S. in engineering from the University of Pennsylvania, a B.A. and M.A. in economics from the University of Cambridge, and a J.D. from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I want to remind everyone that this event is on the record. There are a number of rep representatives of the media uh, who are with us today, and the event is being carried live. Without further ado, I'll invite Jay Powell to join us, and thank you so much for launching this season. Thank you, Marie, Jose. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to the Economic Club. Uh, and thanks to the students who are here. Uh, I think I enjoy talking to students more than almost any other group. Uh, well, I'm grateful to be back. The Economic Club is where I gave my first public speech as SEC chairman in July of 2017. In that speech, I discussed the principles that would guide my SEC chairmanship. I believe we, and we is important to me, have followed those principles. We are exceptional division and office heads and the approximately 4,400 dedicated women and men who are the SEC have accomplished a substantial amount. Yet, let there be no doubt, there is a lot more to do. My remarks today will proceed in three parts. First, an overview of some of our recent initiatives. Second, some observations about our efforts to combat offshore corruption including the undesirable effects of a continuing lack of global commitment in this area. And third, a discussion of, the current, of some of the current market issues we are monitoring. In addition, because this is the Economic Club, 
and more because I enjoy acknowledging the insights the field of economics has provided us, I will mention some economic tenets and related luminaries that we reference from time to time at the SEC. Let me give you an example. When we discuss leverage and capital structure more generally, I will turn to our chief economist, S.P. Kothari, and say something like, Miller Modigliani. Generally, S.P. smiles back. I know better than to ask if he's just humoring me. Before I go further, I should note that my views are my own and do not reflect the views of my fellow commissioners or the SEC staff. So some recent initiatives. In June, the Commission adopted a package of rulemakings and interpretations designed to enhance the quality and transparency of retail investors' relationships with investment advisors and broker-dealers. This comprehensive package brings the standards of conduct and required disclosures for financial professionals in line with what a reasonable investor would expect. Said simply, from discount brokerage to internet advisors to full service commission brokerage to a wrap fee combination of advisory and brokerage, financial professionals cannot put their interests ahead of their clients or customers' interests. And they must tell their clients and customers in plain language the scope of the services they're providing and how they are paid for those services. Pretty simple. I note that this pretty simple approach is in line with the candor and commitment that sophisticated institutional investors have long demanded and received. Let me talk a little more about candor and consistent commitment. It not only provides clarity and comfort on an individual level, it may foster competition and better pricing on a market level. This is fundamental economics. Pareto, Friedman, Pharma, Samuelson, and my personal favorite as a student, Ken Arrow, would all tell us that reducing opacity in pricing, adopting rules that can be observed efficiently and are enforced generally and predictably, and otherwise providing for the ability of customers to shop will improve consumer outcomes dramatically. Personally, I remain in awe of those economists' combination of math mathematical aptitude, market awareness, and social optimism. We should look to them more often. Our final rulemaking package was the result of an organic process, drawing on the experience and expertise of our staff, as well as input from an array of market participants, including from seven investor town halls around the country, where, in an unscripted, take any questions environment, we heard directly from investors. I'm going to depart from my prepared remarks here. You know what people told us? They wish they knew more about investing earlier, and they wish they got started earlier. We're working on that, too. So we've continued these town halls, and I'm so grateful to our staff for bringing long overdue regulatory rationality and clarity to this important market, which encompasses 43 million American households. Okay, so I spoke about the power of choice, competition, and clear investor-oriented rules and investment services. However, in the absence of access to a meaningful range of investment opportunities, those key principles have less impact. This is an issue of growing concern. I'll explain. We now have two segments in our capital markets. One, public markets, mainly exchange-list equities and treasuries and other classes of debt securities, including municipal bonds. And two, private markets, private equity and venture capital investments and certain classes of debt securities. 25 years ago, the public markets dominated the private markets in virtually every measure. Today, by many measures, the private markets outpace our public markets, including in aggregate size. Now I'll invoke a common critique of economists. Harry Truman and many others have longed for a one-handed economist. This issue needs multiple hands. I'll attempt to use only two. On the one hand, the breadth, depth, and nimble nature of our modern private capital markets, which is both unrivaled and coveted around the globe, has substantially contributed to the competitiveness of the U.S. firms and the performance of the U.S. economy generally. We should not do anything to impair the effectiveness of our private capital markets. On the other hand, we have roughly half the number of public companies we had 20 years ago. Growing companies are staying private substantially longer and public equity markets are being used more for liquidity by 
private equity and venture investors than for accessing new growth capital. The problem is Main Street investors generally have access to only one hand, our public markets. They have extremely limited and in many cases costly and otherwise less attractive access to our private markets. This should, surprise, this should not surprise any of us. Let's go back to The Economist. For a host of reasons, including our approach to regulating participation in these markets, the marginal cost to a company of including an individual investor, other than perhaps friends and family, in a private offering is very high. On the other hand, because individuals generally can commit substantially less capital than professional institutional investors, the marginal benefit to the company of including such investors is very low. Said another way, willing buyers and willing sellers cannot meet efficiently. This is where I turn to my friend SP and say, George Akerlof, Market for Lemons. I love to cite this work. I do it all the time, probably more than I should. But anyway, for the students in the room, they know well. Akerlof explained why, for a long time, the used car market included only bad used cars. Why? Why did it include only lemons? Because you could not tell a good used car from a bad used car. Accordingly, buyers assumed all used cars were bad and priced them accordingly. They priced low. In turn, because buyers offered only bad or low pricing, sellers offered only bad used cars. This problem has actually been partially solved by incentive alignment and information gap bridging techniques, including enforceable used car guarantees, certified pre-owned. I believe this situation, both the public hand and the private hand, should be addressed. We should increase the attractiveness of our public capital markets as places for companies to raise capital, not just find liquidity. And we should increase the type and quality of opportunities for our Main Street investors in our private markets. On the public market hand, our division of corporation finance, led by Bill Hinman, can boast many recent initiatives designed to increase the attractiveness of public markets while maintaining or enhancing our unparalleled commitment to investor protection. I'll rattle off a few. Modernizing financial disclosure rules for business combinations and debt offerings. Expanding key jobs act initiatives to improve, I'm sorry, expanding key jobs act initiatives to more public companies and recognizing that one size does not fit all, permitting scaled disclosure by public companies. Before I turn to our efforts to broaden investor access to our private markets, I want to make another point about our public markets. There's a product that we utilize countless times a day, has almost incalculable social value, incalculable social value, dyslexia, and often is overlooked or at least taken for granted. The product is market prices. Prices for stocks and bonds and other assets generated by markets that are transparent, information rich and fair are of, a, are of immense value to our economy. They are, to cite Paul Samuelson again, public goods. Generally, once prices are published, we can all use them. Like lighthouses, they are, in economist speak, non-excludable and non-rivalrous. In most cases, I cannot keep you from using price information. And my use of price information does not affect your ability to use that information. There is more. Main Street investors can be confident that public company stock prices reflect the views of professional investors. This is the rare kind of free riding that economists adore. And it underpins Malkiel's random walk down Wall Street and the rise of passive investors. On the other hand, from the perspective of firms, managers making long-term decisions, such as whether to invest in human talent, equipment and research, rely substantially on metrics that are themselves dependent on today's public market generated pricing information. These include EBITDA multiples and cost of capital estimates that, now get this, somewhat ironically, these public market generated pricing metrics are essential to the efficient functioning of our private markets. Now, Congress and the SEC have long sought to expand Main Street access to our private capital markets while preserving investor protection. Recent initiatives include regulation crowdfunding, 
expanding Regulation A and lifting the ban on general solicitation for rules under Regulation B. These various efforts have had benefits, but they also have added what I would say are new patches to an already patchwork regulatory framework that, re that remains rooted in income and wealth tests for investor access. We're taking a fresh look at this framework with the aim to increase access to our private capital markets for our Main Street investors, including examining whether appropriately structured funds can facilitate Main Street investor access in a manner that ensures incentive alignment with professional investors, just like our public capital markets. Main Street investors and professional investors are in it together. Let's find a way in funds that they're in it together. And otherwise provides appropriate investor protection. Stay tuned. We have some other initiatives going on. I'll uh, list out a few before turning to the FCPA. One is modernizing our regulatory approach to investment funds, increasing transparency in the corporate and municipal bond markets, and improving and examining our equity market structure. We also recently took a first step in increasing transparency and accountability in the area of proxy voting. Turning now to the effectiveness of our efforts, together with our colleagues at the Department of Justice, to combat offshore corruption around the globe. For the past two plus decades, we have vigorously enforced the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, or FCPA. The SEC has brought nearly 80 FCPA cases in the past five years alone, involving alleged misconduct in more than 60 countries. To be clear, I believe this work is important. Corruption is corrosive. We see examples where corruption leads to poverty, exploitation, and conflict. Yet we must face the fact that in many areas of the world, our work may not be having the desired effect. Why? In significant part because many other countries, including those that have long had similar offshore anti-corruption laws on their books, do not enforce those laws. Couple this asymmetry and our unique, on our unique enforcement position with, one, the fact that U.S. jurisdiction generally is limited to areas where U.S. and U.S. limited companies do business, U.S. listed companies do business, and two, the reality that there are countries where the business opportunities are attractive, but corruption is endemic, and in that mix, you have the potential for undesirable results. Let's go back to The Economist. John Nash, John Tirol, and many other greats who developed and applied game theory to economics and regulation could tell us a lot about the strong incentives for other countries not to enforce vigorously offshore corruption laws against their companies. Assume a hypothetical country with business promise but endemic corruption. If all other countries pursue the common, cooperative, morally grounded policy or strategy in game theory terms, of not allowing their companies to engage in offshore corruption, the country with widespread corruption may change its practices and cross-border business would be conducted competitively and more on the up and up. However, when this cooperative anti-corruption strategy is being pursued by others, the benefits of playing a non-cooperative strategy are great, particularly if your company, if your company is the only one who is cheating your company wins the lucrative offshore business with no competition. And the country with endemic corruption doesn't improve. This is not a new observation. Speaking generally, the response to this observation in the past has been to acknowledge the need for greater international cooperation and cite a few isolated indicia of improvement. Speaking for myself, I've not seen sufficiently meaningful improvement. To be clear, I do not intend to change the FCPA enforcement posture of the SEC. We should, however, recognize that we are acting largely alone and other countries may be incentivized to play, and I believe some are in fact playing, strategies that take advantage of our laudable efforts. Taking a step back, this experience, including the FCPA-driven withdrawal of U.S. and U.S. listed firms from certain jurisdictions, illustrates a broader point. Globally oriented laws with no limited or asymmetric enforcement can produce individually unfair and collectively suboptimal results. 
I assure you that this reality is at the front of my mind when I engage with my international counterparts on matters where common cooperative enforcement strategies are essential to effectiveness, including recent calls for greater securities law-based regulation of environmental and social issues. Serious stuff. Laws without enforcement are just words. <coughs> okay, turning to the more positive. In the remainder of my time, I'll discuss the state of our corporate debt markets, the pending LIBOR transition, and Brexit. I would note that related to each of these issues, the Commission strives to coordinate with our regulatory counterparts at home and in other jurisdictions and not to venture, venture too far out of our lane. Staying in your lane is important. In the United States, outstanding corporate debt stands at almost $10 trillion and now sits at almost 50% of GDP. To quickly round out the picture, federal debt is approximately $22 trillion, mortgage debt is over $15 trillion, municipal debt is almost $4 trillion, and student loan debt is approximately $1.6 trillion. Those numbers should attract our attention. Two more facts. Debt securities accounted for approximately 62% of money market fund assets. Sometimes we call these liquidity-oriented products. As of the first quarter of 2019, which is close to its peak of 64%. And low investment grade and high yield debt have been trading at some. Did I say something wrong? <laughs> Maybe it's one of those countries I want to cooperate. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Should, okay, I'll go, I'll go quickly. Should we be surprised about these debt levels and the increase in debt held by. Should we be surprised about the levels and the amount held by mutual funds, CLOs, and other vehicles? Emphatically, no. We should not be surprised. Should we be cognizant of the growth in corporate debt? Who holds that debt and the potential ramifications for our markets and our economy? Of course we should. Domestically, and particularly internationally, corporate debt growth has been fostered through a decade of accommodative monetary policies. We want businesses to hire and invest and consumers to spend. And globally, we are usually, we're using favorable interest rates and other tools to encourage that behavior. Contemporaneously, global regulators have encouraged banks to hold less debt, particularly less low and sub-investment grade debt. The result, more corporate debt overall and a greater percentage held, held outside of banks, including by funds. Just math. But if this is not at all surprising, should we worry? Let me be clear, I'm not raising any alarm bells here. Many economic indicators are very strong, but it's my job to work. So the question for me is, where should we focus our attention? Before I discuss those areas for balance, I'll just note a few comforting facts. Recently, the U.S. has seen its balance sheet, and GDP, balance sheet to GDP ratio stay flat and actually start to decrease as we have slowed quantitative easing. Other countries have not done this. In addition, for the past few years, the size of the mortgage, student loan, and municipal markets has been generally flat in relation to GDP. So some good news. Now turning to areas of focus, we certainly should monitor the size of corporate debt in aggregate and by industry, the location and types of holders of that debt, and credit quality. And we should consider the likely actions of these market participants if market sentiment or other circumstances change. We should recognize what prices and price movements in the corporate debt market are telling us. For example, recently, on a total return basis, the upside has become more limited, while the downside has stayed about the same. Together, we with our fellow regulators should monitor banks' exposure to non-banks. Since non-banks now have more exposure, let's find out how much exposure banks have to those non-banks. Among other things, through credit lines to investment funds, Clearing banks' supply of balance sheet capacity to permit client clearing, banks' exposure to funds through derivatives, and overlapping portfolio holdings and holdings susceptible to liquidity shocks. We also should monitor flows of funds. On these and other topics, I'm pleased to note the level of interagency coordination, particularly among the Treasury, Federal Reserve, CFTC, OCC, and FDIC, has been strong and I think helps all of us to better understand the broader trends and market implications. I am particularly grateful to Secretary Mnuchin, Chairman Powell, Vice Chairman Quarles, 
former Chairman John Carlo, Chairman Tarbert, Comptroller Auding, and Chairman McWilliams for their efforts to consistently work candidly, cooperatively, and proactively on these issues. Okay. Finally, I want to give you a brief update on some of the Commission's work relating to LIBOR transition and Brexit. I identified these as potential risk areas last year. LIBOR is expected to cease publication, publication after the end of 2021. There are approximately 200, I, can't, I can never believe that number, 200 trillion in notional transactions referencing U.S. dollar LIBOR. And the Federal Reserve estimates that more than 35 trillion of these obligations will not mature by the end of 2021. This is not a small issue, and it will not resolve itself. In July, our staff issued a statement emphasizing the importance of this issue for market participants of every type. I will say again, market participants should assess their exposure to LIBOR and decide how to actively manage that risk, and they should ensure that any contracts that extend beyond the 2021 date either reference LIBOR and have an effective fallback language or do not reference LIBOR. Finally, Brexit. We continue to closely monitor the potential effects of Brexit on markets and market participants. Here, I encourage our issuers, financial services firms, and other market participants to fight off the complacency and fatigue that is endemic to situations of this type. I encourage you to continue to prepare for and reasonably inform your investors of the potential impacts of Brexit. At the SEC, we are continuing to work with our domestic and non-U.S. counterparts to identify and plan for the moving target that is Brexit. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today, and I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you so much to Jay Clayton. You mentioned candor and commitment, and you certainly showed your candor and clearly also your commitment to making our markets more effective and efficient, but also your commitment to public service, which is admirable for both you and your family. So thank you. Uh, we have two questioners today, Harold Ford Jr., who is a former U.S. congressman, and Bob Pisani from On Air Stock, CNBC, a journalist. I think, Harold, you're there you are. Thank you. <laughs> Harold, I, I will I jump right in. Uh, Chairman, Hi. thank you for your candor and your remarks. Uh, I want to build on your, your last statement about Brexit and ask, uh, how are you as chair in the SEC thinking about a hard Brexit specifically and whether it leads to recession? Are these issues out of your control? And perhaps equally important, are U.S. companies situated and prepared for a hard Brexit or a worst-case scenario? Okay. Well, Thanks, and thanks for being here, Harold. I really appreciate it. Um, so if you'd asked me that question a year ago, I think my level of nervousness would have been higher than it is today. And I say that because for a lot of companies, Brexit is in many ways already come. People who run companies prepare for events and are, have been ordering their affairs to deal with a potential Brexit. So I think time has put us in a better place today than we were a year ago. That said, events of this type that involve a combination of economics, social policy, and whatnot are inherently impossible to model. You know, we can all plan. I know financial services firms, and we've been checking in with them, have been doing a good job of thinking about it. But you know, exactly how this will play out in the real economy the, the, the range of outcomes remains more than anybody should be comfortable with. That's how I look at it. Uh, Jay, Bob Pisani, um, I want to uh, thank you for your, uh, your zeal in uh, expressing your desire to protect the American investing public, which was the reason the SEC was created. I like to remind people back in 1932, and for your great interest in the IPO market, it's the subject of tremendous interest to our listeners and our readers at CNBC. Uh, and I just want to follow up about your points on IPOs. You've talked eloquently about wanting to make uh, the public markets more attractive uh, and easier to go public. I have seen this for my 22 years on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Many people, many small companies have come on the floor, introduced themselves, said, 
We're considering going public, but the costs are ruinous. The legal costs are tremendously high. For small companies, it's really, really difficult. So I laud your efforts here. The problem is that when the rubber hits the road between talking about that, but we all agree it should be easier, and the reality, because every time I do a story or any of my colleagues do a story about the crazy costs of going public, the buy side people call me up and say, hold on a minute, Bob. I know your colleagues and you like to mock these 400 and 500 page tombstones that the companies are required to put out. However, can we point out that those of us who are buying this, these IPOs, this is the primary document that we have to understand what these companies are doing. I understand you don't like that they're four or 500 pages because you don't like to read them, but we have to read them because we have to understand what the company's doing to invest for our clients that are out there. So they always say, Bob, what do you want to do here? What, do you want this 400, 500 page document to be reduced to five pages and a little spreadsheet so that you can explain it easier for people? I guess what I'm getting at is how do you really get to that point about really making it easier for these companies to go public and reducing the legal costs overall? Yeah. Uh, well, Bob, I think, look, you, you're out. It, if it were easy, we would have solved it already, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's part of the issue here. Um, but it's, um, and, and we focus on the legal costs because they're tangible. They're, they're actually in the document. You can see how much it costs to go public, and, and they've gone up a lot. Okay, we have to ask ourselves, have they gone up too much? And the legal costs are not just the legal costs of becoming a public company, but it's the legal costs of staying a public company, which have also gone up a lot by, by any measure. You know, if, put it in real dollar terms. I, I think, in my mind, it's 3x, 4x what it was when I started doing this. Um, but there are other costs of being a public company, in, including the, the scrutiny that you face as a public company. And you should face scrutiny. I, want, I do want directors to be nervous about whether they're performing for their shareholders, but you know, do, we, do we have the right balance in terms of long-termism and short-termism in that pressure that they feel? I'm sure there, I know people on this dais who you know, face the short-term pressure and long for some, some really constructive long-term pressure. Now, I'm hitting a few highlights. Let me, let me say what, why I think it's important to solve this problem. It's what I just talked about. For our Main Street investors, in our public capital markets, they get a, they get a pretty fair shake. They, they, they get to invest alongside sophisticated institutional investors at the same cost. That's, very, that's a very hard system to replicate in any other way. And the reason we focus so much on them is those are the people who are putting their money to work for the long term. They, they, don't, they, don't, they generally don't trade in and out of the markets on a daily, weekly, yearly basis. They're putting their money in their 401k and they're leaving it there. That capital is really important to our country and we should do what we can to make sure that they're getting to invest alongside the sophisticated money. Just, just to follow up on that, and I hope you do find a way, this is of intense interest to all the people watching these you know, investors in general, but the, opposite, the, the other side, how do you expand opportunities for Main Street investors to participate in private equity? I get bitter emails from investors saying, you know, Uber, Bob, this is not a startup. This is, this is a middle stage company now that's been around, you know, eight, nine, ten years. Some of these other ones, these unicorns have been even longer. We buy into the back end of these companies, the average investor, these private people do too. So you've been on the right track on that. Again, that's still a question of how much disclosure outside of qualified investors is actually going to be required for people to get in. We want more people to invest in these companies when they're, when they're younger stage companies too. The question is how do you get yeah. the balance right? Look, I, I, I would like the public capital markets to be attractive to growing companies. We, you know, we want a growing company when it still wants capital to grow, not when investors are exiting. There's a big difference in that dynamic, and I would like to see companies get into the public markets so that Main Street investors can participate in that growth capital stage as opposed to the more mature you know, liquidity and sustain stage. The news seems daily, if not weekly, and obviously this morning we read of the AT&T and Elliott uh, conversation narrative. What are your views on activism, uh, and is activism being used properly or improperly from your standpoint or the SEC standpoint? Um, so look, like I said, I think directors, whether it's a public company or a private company, directors should 
be thinking, what do my, well, what do my owners want? You know, that should be in front of their mind. Um, and you know, engagement through the proxy process and activism is one way for people to express that. Now we're looking at whether we're actually getting that or we're getting something else. And we want to make sure that the that shareholder engagement is indeed gain, engagement with shareholders. Pe you know, people who are looking for long-term returns. That's that's the lens through which I look at this. And as we've had round tables, we're starting to explore the proxy process, voting, access to the proxy, those types of things. And I, and I think I'm an optimist. I think we're going to make improvements in that area. Uh, let me follow up on a slightly different question, and that's Bitcoin, which simply refuses to die. And you it, refuse to stop asking me about it. I, well, <laughs> you know, I know I'm a bit of a pain on this, but I, not, when, that, when Bitcoin blew up three or four years ago, not since the dot-com bust have we had this level of inquiry from average investors just flooding us with how legit is this? Is this an investable product? Is this a real breakthrough? Is this a game changer like the internet? We hadn't got email like this since the, uh, really the dot com bust. So I express, I'm expressing the interest level of the viewers and the readers uh, in general. Uh, you, your staff, you and your staff a year and a half ago wrote what we call the famous uh, 1,000 Bitcoin question memo, where it, those of you who hadn't seen it, it was very unusual for the SEC. It basically said, okay, guys, alert. Everyone, you've got to answer our questions before we're going to approve anything on Bitcoin, particularly a Bitcoin ETF. And they basically posed a thousand questions. But they, they fell into two large buckets. One was the custody issue, particularly security around custody. And the second was the fact that most Bitcoin pricing occurs on foreign ex exchanges that are easily manipulated. And the implication of this is you, the Bitcoin community, had better address these questions before we do anything in the way of approving anything. Are, are we any closer to answering the SEC's concerns, and are we any closer to getting a Bitcoin ETF? So, uh, look, I think, as usual, Bobby, you framed it well. There's, there's the product that is a crypto asset, and then there's the, the trading uh, and, and holding of that asset. We're not merits regulators, you know, and, and we've, we've talked about whether some of these assets are, in fact, securities. Uh, been pretty clear that we don't see Bitcoin as we stand here today as a security. Um, but when you put it into a product and you make it a security, then we have to worry about whether it trades appropriately or not and whether it can be held appropriately or not. Um, on the custody issue, we've put out recent statements. For those, who, for those who want this to become part of a Main Street investing, um, progress has been made in the custody area. I will say that in the trading area, it troubles me that people look at the trading on these venues and they think it's got the same level of protection that you'd have on an equity market in the U.S., NASDAQ, you know, the MYSE. I'll just say it bluntly. Nothing could be further from the truth. That is, that we have lengthy rule books, all sorts of protections to make sure that prices are not manipulated in the equity markets. I don't see those in the crypto asset markets. Well, last question. Will insider trading always be the delicate enforcement issue that, that it is? And have you guys given thought to how artificial intelligence can help in any way? Um, well, it depends on how you define artificial intelligence, but if you define it as like really sophisticated algorithms that look for patterns that would be you know, unrecognizable to us in our naked eye, we're doing that. And, you know, and, we, and we get cases that way. So uh, if you're doing it, let that be a warning. <laughs>
and October 8th, um, Brad uh, Garing House from Ripple. So I hope as many of you as possible will be able to join us. Enjoy your lunch and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.